So it's now my opportunity, or you know, my pleasure to introduce Luis Mago. I know a lot of people on this call know him well, and some of you are even customers of his. And again, a lot of you had the opportunity to hear Luis speak through our leadership program. He's always like the keynote in the beginning to pump us up. Um, he's he quotes uh, Zen, not Zen in the art, no, the art of war, and I, you know, certainly has some great. Uh, analogies with with that book so i look forward to hearing from him today so luis mago is the chief innovation officer of xb1x and at first i thought okay are there roman numerals in here or what does this mean but i'm sure he will tell us why how, why his company name is xb1x uh he is a computer scientist and strategist and has consulted for small medium and major corporations about the best way to bring strategy innovation and transformation into their companies. After thousands of successful engagements in the USA, Latin America, and Europe, he has proven that any company, if resilient, can tap into external success. A little bit about his company, XB1X, Digital Transformation Enterprise, is a global technology and innovation enterprise that leverages agile performance through simplicity to develop clients into multi-million dollar enterprises across the private, public, and social sectors in the US and globally. The XB1X team is an expert advisor on how to achieve exponential success by embedding innovative technologies digital transformation, analytics, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, blockchain, and strategic designs into agile processes. And our, the actual topic of today, the presentation, what prevents companies to be more innovative? So Luis and his team surveyed 200 plus companies to find out the answer to that question. And the answer was a lack of endurance. So in his talk today, he will help us build a better, more robust, our own companies. He'll dive into the data and explain how you and your organization can start transforming and innovating a pr to produce a nimbler, more productive enterprise by treating resiliency as a competitive advantage. And one thing I also want to add is that, you know, he's, he's always been transforming, pivoting, all those words that we've heard a lot about because during this, this pandemic, um, you know, Luis was ahead of the game years ago doing this. He was absolutely prepared to coach companies, consult with companies and teach companies how to react in a time like we're in now. So it's even more impressive uh, to, to hear from him when, when he was so far ahead of the game and knew that, that as a business leader, you need to pivot and be ready for changes. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Luis Mago. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for, thank you for everything. Thank you for having me in here. So, so this is gonna be a presentation first. And unfortunately, we don't have um, the opportunity to, to interact. So I'm just gonna have the presentation first, and this I'm, then I'm gonna show you slides with uh, examples of companies that are doing a lot of innovation during this COVID pandemic. And the, the intent is for you to see what they're doing um, and, and, and maybe get some ideas for your businesses. So something that we all have in common right now is the word hunker. Uh, the word originally is from Scots, where it first appeared around 1720. The hunkering down we're doing right now is more like a figurative use of the word. It comes to mean things like concentrate one resources when conditions are bad, hide out or take shelter. I know that you're not gonna be able to, to answer, but let me ask you, how much more hunker down are you ready to endure? Um, so how are you managing life and business when all of a sudden things don't go as you have planned? Or better, how do you react when your competition 
and your colleagues are achieving the success and growth that you believe is rightfully yours? Are they better than you are? Are you better today than you were a year ago, five years ago? How do you explain when things don't go as you assume? More important, why is it that they succeed faster? Do they have an edge? What say you? Well, cons widely considered a visionary and a genius, why was Steve Jobs so innovative? Was Steve better than you? I say he was not. I say there is more to this than meets the eye. 20 years ago, I became aware that we are all Steve Jobs in the making. This discovery profoundly changed my view on how I thought life and business work. It even changed the way in which I chose to live, made me migrate to foreign countries, made me change who I was. As it turned out, changed my entire life, made me whole and made me aware that there is a system which we can tap into for growth and success. All great organizations, leaders, parents, teachers, and corporations became effective and influential because of it. They all acted, communicated, and performed exactly the same way. And based on this realization, I discovered the roadmap to everlasting success. I call it the infinity endurance model, the key for eternal transformation and innovation for life and business. Because resilience in innovation and transformation is as important as endurance. And that's the idea that I want you to live out with. But how? How is it that this simple method of infinite endurance shows the path for some of us to become the best at what we do. Let me explain. Everyone knows who they really are, deep inside, the leader, the organization, the team knows what they do correctly and how they are failing. However, very few have the power of enduring an unpleasant or difficult process or situation without ever giving away. We intend to go from A to Z, but stop somewhere in the middle. Most of us get going, but very few of us go over the limit of our endurance. What do you want? What can you do to differentiate from your competitors? Why, in spite of everything that is happening, you continue on? Are you fully prepared for the drastic shift in working and lifestyle methods that are needed to keep us ahead of the curve? The truth is that innovative and transformative organizations and leaders weather their storm. They all dream, they all decide, they all execute. They are resilience and endurance masters. So let me give you as an example. Yes, you. You're easy to understand and you get it. Have you ever been depressed? Have you lost a job? Have you lost the most important client? Have you ever been in debt? Have you or your loved ones struggled with cancer? Have you been broke? Have you ever been heartbroken? If you have and you are here, you have endured. However, how realistic is it to think that you or your company will ever be engaged by a potential client because of your losses? Most likely, if you were to use your life story to convince a prospect to engage your services, you will be rejected. Everyone communicates what they do or what they provide, but no one translates resilience into what they say. Your current business offering is a nice statement of a good to have, but it does not reflect how resilient you can be. Here's what I suggest for you to start saying. Everything we do, we believe, is entirely possible. What we offer you and what we offer your organization is to ramp up your bottom line performance. We will help you secure 
a game changing portfolio to make you a winner. We will redefine what your company is and does. Better yet, since we have transformed our organization through a never ending endurance process, we will help you do the same. Our products and services will help you go in an all in transformational process. By leveraging our expertise and resilience, we will be helping you develop the key muscles required to create the momentum and propel your enterprise to the next level. Does this sound better? With the help of the Infinity Endurance Model, you can translate your personal or organizational experience into a new transformative business model that offers a product or services that will make every single person in this room perfectly comfortable buying from you. Of course, you must make sure that you take disciplined effort to boost not only your productivity, but also your accountability, your transparency, your execution, and your decision-making process. If you don't, people will try your product, indeed, but they will not be a repeat or an enthusiastic customer. The goal in this normal, I propose, is not to do business as you were doing before. The goal is to do business with people who believe in your resilience and that know that you will do for them as you have done for yourself. Endure over the limit without ever giving away. But don't take my word as a face value. What I'm telling you is based on psychology, strategy, science, leadership research data. For example, resilient people know that they are not entitled to a perfect life where happy social media pictures, impeccable resumes, and infinite affluence is the norm. Best-in-class organizations know that their success is not based on the product or the service that they sell, but on what their customers believe these organizations are to them. And effective leaders know that business challenges cannot be overcome by technical solutions in isolation. They require data analysts that approach them empathetically. Why? Because it has been proven that successful data science outcomes rely on actually understanding the problem being solved and having a strong collaboration between the technical and business team to ensure everyone is on the same page. So you see, there you have it. When you consistently combine the infinite endurance model of resiliency, empathy, disruption, agility, focus, enthusiasm, and acceptance of the things we cannot change with a strong motive, people will easily understand your product and service without any other explanation, regardless of how complex or simple your offering may be. In other words, in this new normal, digitization, advanced technology, and other forms of tech-enabled disruptions are upending industry after industry, pressuring incumbent companies not only to scratch out stronger financial returns, but also to remake who and what they are as organization. Because of this, I say, more than ever, you have an edge, an opportunity to take over markets where you didn't have it before. This new normal has opened up industry, sectors, and created new markets where these incumbent companies, for the first time, have to compete with nimbler and more agile organizations led by more resilient, human, and committed individuals like yourselves. But I know what you're thinking. You're saying, wow, it sounds right, but it's not possible. Well, as a PhD in applied positive technology, uh, psychology expert wrote, resilient people are really good at choosing where they place their attention. They have a habit of realistically appraising situations to focus on the things that they can change and accept the things that they can't. Therefore, you can transform and innovate if you are truly resilient. If you are not, you will not survive the new normal. 
Don't forget, be careful of choosing where you place your attention. The goal is not only to sell more, but to remodel your business and your clients' enterprises to emerge better and stronger from the crisis. And when I say remodel, it is not just a cliche. It must be a pledge that you believe is possible. It is the undertaking that you must feel empowered to make. Meaning, to deliver most of your changes and of your clients around the faster adoption of technology and digital growth with a human touch. In short, to deliver disruptive strategic-based solutions for life and business because they are win-win. Now, this brings us to back to Steve. Yes, Steve Jobs. He was not the greatest technologist or engineer of his generation, but he's perhaps the greatest user of technology to have ever lived. He's also the most resilient person in the business world. In his own words, he said, I didn't see it then, but it turned out that getting fired from Apple was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. It freed me to enter one of the most creative periods of my life. Sometimes life hits you in the head with a brick. Do not lose faith. See, there you have it. Now, way back, way back in the early 1559, when 25th year old Elizabeth I became queen, she understood her supremely fragile position. She was a woman. She had zero credibility as a ruler, no experience, respect, or authority to draw upon. She had no political experience. However, she was schooled in hardship as she lost her mother and her most beloved stepmother at a young age. Elizabeth was very well educated. Unlike her most important minister, she spoke and read all the major European languages and understood their nuances. Thus, made sure that she, and only she, personally conducted diplomacy. Elizabeth was a master negotiator, and she made England's finance her mission. From the first day of her rules, she made it clear that she was all business. She would work harder, reduce expenditures, and sacrifice her own income. All activity was to be directed towards lifting England out of the hole it had fallen into. However, a few hundred miles away in Spain, King Philip II began sneaking Jesuit priests into England to spread Catholic faith and secretly foment rebellion. He built his navy and prepared for the invasion of England to control and restore it to Catholicism. Even though he knew Elizabeth was disciplined and clever, King Philip was convinced that she had a major disadvantage. Elizabeth was a woman, unsuited to lead a war. King Philip had a large and powerful navy, an immense amount of gold from the New World. He oversaw every detail of the invasion. An armada of 130 ships and 30,000 men that would easily destroy the English Navy, open the way to London to capture Elizabeth and put his own daughter in the throne of England. Although we are not kings or queens, we are all driven by the same sense of entitlement. We want our work to be respected, our lives to be praised, regardless of how much we have achieved. We feel that our ideas and projects should be taken seriously no matter what. We expect for everything to be fast and easy. Before losing what we truly love, before having our hearts broken, or before filing for chapter 11, we always felt emboldened. We felt like royalty, and this feeling kept us from being genuine. It made us ignore reality. However, after a major loss, we started to become less lazy and more conscientious. We raised our standards, improved ourselves, and became more sensitive to others. We learned 
how to be better leaders, make better decisions, and put our intelligence and wisdom at work. If you're still insensitive, you're ready for a treat because this pandemic has leveled the playing field. On May 1588, Philip ordered the Spanish Armada to invade England. They had never done battle with smaller and faster ships like the English. With the high winds and the fire spreading quickly from ship to ship, the Spanish retreated and lost most of their ships and 20,000 soldiers. The English lost no ship and had less than 100 casualties. Philip lost in the most humiliating way. The invasion left Spain in bankruptcy as a second-rated power. Philip could have stayed Elizabeth ally, but instead he felt it was his duty to invade and conquer England. Big mistake. Back to this century, a recent study by Cisco reported that 74% of the respondents shared that their business will emerge stronger from this crisis. The source of this belief is likely to be the transformation and innovation that most organizations have gotten into since the pandemic started. However, a McKinsey study revealed that 47% of the company they studied didn't make any of the key moves required to achieve a successful transformation. Only 12% of companies made at least one big strategic move to transform, showing that in order to be effective, it is, critically, it is critical to comprehensively apply the infinity endurance model component to your innovation and transformation process. Data also shows that internal and external disruptive innovation is required for real comprehensive change to take place. In conclusion, the data clearly shows that successful transformation processes require to be holistic comprehensive, consistent, and disruptive, but also that the market is ripe for innovative way to do business in a more efficient and productive manner. Thanks to this new normal, almost every industry has the same opportunity to be disrupted by a lesser, more nimble, and agile opponent. The infinity endurance model tells us that if you want to achieve effective transformational success and translate innovation to effectively and consistently increase your bottom line, you need to be strategic at selecting the core competencies that you will focus on. For example, making 20% more innovative improvement than the average of your competitors will give you an edge. At the same time, if you're able to consistently increase your performance and accountability in 65% versus the prior years, you will ensure a unique, durable, and profitable position in the marketplace. Among your other priorities are to build momentum, engage your workforce, and make the change personal for yourself and for your company. This means comprehensively developing efficient performance management system, servant leadership skills, robust successful structures, an effective way of working while embracing a level of commitment that may be unprecedented for you. Will you take this normal seriously? Are you ready to revamp your business outcomes, adapt to change, and scale the resources across the organization to widen the business opportunities? Will you automate every repetitive and complex analytic process to accelerate insight and actions in order to focus on performance management? What about your newly developed remote workforce that is here to stay? What are the new transformational systems that you will put in place to increase their performance and productivity? What about your customers? Are you now ready to finally create a customer-centric prioritization process in tandem with effective IT improvement? Are you ready to address the real gaps that you have dismissed in the past. Michael Porter's second principle of strategy is the delivery of a value proposition. Porter defined this as a set of benefits that are different than those offered by your competitors. 
What is your new strategic and disruptive position then? What are you going to do to make people follow you? Let's digress a little bit to King Philip for a moment, the famous loser against the famous woman. Like Elizabeth, we must realize that we are actually in a weak position and we must struggle to find a winning proposition. We know that there is no one that can help. We expect nothing from the government or from the financial institutions. We also expect nothing to change. Everything we may get from others, even their respect, must be earned. We have to consistently prove ourselves at all times. Therefore, if you climb in the saddle, be ready for the ride. The market is full of Phillips. Are you ready to beat them? For starters, we have to show that our primary consideration is not ourselves or our sensitive egos, but the welfare of our organization and of our families. We must be responsive to our customers' wants and needs. We must work harder than others, sacrificing our own interests if necessary. More importantly, we must be accountable for each of our actions at all times. We must be nimble, humble, agile, and knowledgeable. We must educate ourselves to the outer limits and master our craft like no one else in the market. We must become servant leaders that speak based on data. We must leave ignorance in the back burner and be impeccable with word and behavior. With such an attitude, we will notice an instantaneous positive effect from our surrounding. People will open themselves to your influence. Recent report and data note that a large number of organizations and leaders underestimate the increasing momentum of digitization, the behavioral changes, and the technology driving it. 83% of the business leaders have no clue about the reskilling, the remote working new normal, and the scale of the disruption bearing down on them. Just 8% of the company's surveys say their current business model would remain economically viable if the industry keep digitizing and its current course of speed. And 70% of them will cease to exist in the next two to five years. This realization is coming not at a moment too soon. Even before the global health crisis ahead, 92% of company leaders surveys in the United States and other countries thought that their business model would not remain viable at the rates of digitization at that time. This pandemic just put this whole scenario on asteroids. What will you do then? Will you learn the essential of innovation, transformation, and digitization? Or will you just sit on the side and watch your successful competitors parade by? Well, if you are the resilient person, who knows there is no tomorrow. You will learn and discover how the convergence of business remodeling, strategy, innovation, quiet love customer service, analytic, big data, process automation, and leadership are the solution to your current challenges. You are now cognizant that as soon as you leave this meeting, you will get started with a disruptive transformational process to fuel yourself and your organization. This is the priority because I am sure that six more, six more months in your house doing the same thing over and over cannot be what you want to be doing. Winston Churchill believed that Providence had assigned him with destiny. He felt accountable to God for the execution of that role. He also believed that we need leaders with a long range focus. After Dunkirk, in a weakened British Empire, he said, we shall go on to the end. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. And even if this island or a large part of it were subjugated and starving, then our empire beyond the seas would carry on the struggle until in God's good time, the new world 
with all its power and might, step forth to the rescue and the liberation of the old. Churchill was right. The new world, us American, with all our power and might, stepped forth into the rescue and liberated the old. But look at us today, secluded in our homes. Some of us afraid of the future, uncertain about the most basic needs. For the first time in our lifetime, we are at the bottom of the Maslow hierarchy of needs. We're concerned about where our food, water, warmth will come from. We see our security and safety slipping through our fingers. Our relationships, our friends are more remote than ever, separated by social distance, by the pandemic, by dogma. Our feeling of accomplishment are being shattered by an uncertain future. Achieving our full potential seems to be a childhood, a childhood dream. But I say no to this sketchy reality. What would Steve Jobs have us do? I say that there are people, organizations, countries and companies that are not letting the new normal control them, but they are taking control of it. They are successfully applying the infinity endurance model. Therefore, I ask you to do what Steve Jobs would have done. I want you not only to follow his lead, I want you to be as resilient as he was because resilience in innovation and transformation is as important as endurance. Go ahead, achieve the impossible like there is not tomorrow. Thank you. We're going to do a brief summary. Uh, you have it, we send it to you, just follow it. Mm. And I'm gonna show you some how resilient plants fell short. This is a study by Deloitte, uh, where it shows how we were not really prepared for, for this pandemic. Um, I'm gonna show you some findings that we, have, that we have gotten and show you example of companies that have embarked in effective transformation and innovation programs and a Q and A if, we, if it's possible. The endurance model, you need to use it, you can use it. You can take this and literally go one by one and try to create uh, a list of uh, action plans where you can focus and, and, and deliver on them. Um, something interesting, three quarters of respondents felt that their firms were better than moderately prepared to handle this impact of the crisis. Only 16% six, only felt that the response plan worked well. So just imagine 59% of companies didn't include pandemic or something like what we're um, experiencing. No one, 50% did not address extreme shelter in place. 34% they have gap on how to address technology. If you look at these four, they're incredibly uh, impactful. Good plan, but not harmonized or linked. So this gives you, give you a hint of what are the things that we need to get going and we need to focus on in order to prepare our organizations for what's coming, because this is not gonna be ending yet. On the age of COVID-19, 74% of the respondents believe their business will emerge stronger than the crisis. 49% believe that flexible work is here to stay. 74% of the CFOs plan to increase remote work after the pandemic is over. 80% of the companies have a higher focus on employees' well-being and work balance. 76% of employees feel hard to maintain balance with work. This is, this is staggering. This is gonna generate big challenges in the months to come. And 80% of the organization that foster digital culture reported breakthrough. So everyone that tried to do some changes in digital transformation were started to, to change their business models. So look at companies like Bellrock Capital, um, financial advisors, boutique, your family office. They, they have a focus of growth and preserve your wealth. So what they've been doing, they have adapted with new technology to enhance client services. Digital dashboards with 24 seven easy financial access to their clients. 
and one-on-one -on -one savings, investment, and personal finance services to simplify their service planning access. Other companies like Leadership Institute, uh, which have beautiful, very structured centers and place for uh, CEOs, executives to go and spend a week there, they have gone, <laughs> they have gone virtual. They have transformed their leadership, leadership center. They have gone virtual. They are now providing offerings in order to, to continue developing on their purpose, but now they're providing the same experiences online, which is really amazing. Companies, coaching companies like the Achilles Group have gone virtual as well. They, they have dashboards, one-on-one -on -one, uh, training programs, team the training programs that you can even go online and look at all the performance and, and strength in, in a dashboard. They also, this is a company that also transformed themselves in less than three months. Nonprofit organizations like the Canico Agency, <laughs> they, they also needed to, to, to change because of, of all this pandemic, a lot of nonprofit organizations stopped having events, stopped having uh, the donations went down, so on and so forth. So they created a successful model shift. Um, they created uh, free groups, coaching and resources. Um, they created uh, a, a launch CEO coaching program and, and, they, and they adapted their organization in order to continue developing their social responsibility and provide services not only to local clients, but clients all over the United States and Latin America. Ensign, the Ensign Group, um, they, they're digital transformation experts and they're focused on ensuring that processes and technologies are sustainable over time. So these individuals are experts in blockchain, artificial intelligence. This is a company that is um, in Europe and with offices in Spain, and they had to change. They had to restructure their organization in order to, to provide a wider amount of services and utilize the technology they were using for themselves to be, to be used by clients. They have created new, new systems uh, to, to provide contact, contact tracings for kids, for, um, uh, for, um, uh, uh, for companies and employees. And IBM, IBM just put a billion dollars aside to invest in other companies in the cloud space. Even IBM with their size know that the market is amongst ourselves. They know, wow, I need to invest in order to create third party software providers and digital vendors to, to grow into their ecosystem. So as you can see, you can see the all different organizations from small to large adapting to this not COVID. And these changes are gonna continue. They're gonna intensify. This new normal will continue for more than a year, if not two. So as I said in the speech, we better, we better get ready because wonderful opportunities are ahead of us. I don't know if I can answer any questions. Awesome, thank you very much. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Hear me? Okay, um, thank you very much. And yeah, so I would ask if anybody wants to ask a question, um, either raise your hand or you can type something in the chat box. And I'm gonna actually ask Chastity to help me to keep an eye on uh, if there are any questions, because I can, there's so many people on here that I can't see everyone in one screen. But my first question, since I get to ask the first question, because I've got the microphone, is tell, tell us why you named your company the way you named your company. The ex, you know, why, why you chose that. Well, the name of the, the name is Exponential Growth. So is Exponential ex Group. So... What, what we, the essence of the company is to help any organization to double or triple the size in revenues and size. But 
everyone that we work with are young mm -hmm. and they all they all know xbox mm -hmm. so we change from the exponential group to xb1x specifically for because of xbox and everyone in our i think i'm the oldest one <laughs> so everyone is young uh, uh motivated to to look at things differently and by the way that's that's something that I think is going to keep me young as well. But, but that's the reason why. It's that's very close to Xbox. Very great. That's very, very smart. Very smart. Um, okay, so we do have a question from Kirsten. Um, how do we work with our teams to encourage them to explore alternate paths and revenue streams when they are fear-based and used to doing things a certain way? And then um, she says, sometimes the leader is the only one who's willing to explore and there isn't support from the teams, the staff, other leadership and people like that. Yeah. Um, in one section of the presentation, I talk about data analysts doing the analysis uh, empathetically. We cannot as business leaders expect that our employees are going to come with a solution our employees are really afraid. Everyone is afraid right now. Everyone is, this is the beauty, but the challenge of what we're living today. The beauty is that there's a lot of opportunities, but the challenge is that we are all afraid. We, we do not have the answers. We, none of us, not I, no one. However, that's why the, that infinite endurance model is so important when you go and try to look at each of those attributes and say how you can help your employees. So I will invite you to turn the question around. What would you do, you, to create the necessary changes for you to motivate your employees, for them to feel more comfortable, more assured of the future, so they can become more innovative if you are afraid that you that you're not gonna that you're gonna lose your job if you're afraid that you have no income if you're afraid that maybe in three months you 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 may not be here because you have to move i have a lot of clients that have left their companies because their parents are sick so they need to move to other states or other countries so if that is happening it is you as the leader that need to create that stability in order to help your employees feel better, therefore become more innovative. And you know, you said empathy. So, you know, one of the slides that you showed, you said that 70, 76% of the employees are having a hard time maintaining balance between work and personal. But then on the same slide, it talked about the employers are, are looking at not just staying virtual or you know not just virtual now but continuing virtual even after the the pandemic how how is how do you manage that when you've got um people that are working virtually working from home and working harder feeling like they're working harder than they ever have but on the same breath it's it's the way you know you know, as, as a leader, you want your employees to be more productive. How do you manage that when it's at home as a leader? Um, that is, a, there's a two prong uh, a, a answer to your question. If you remember in one section of the presentation, I said that 92% of all business leaders and companies that we surveyed say that it, at the rate of digitization that was before the pandemic, they, they, their companies were not gonna last. They thought that in two or five years, they were gonna be gone. And I've also said that this pandemic has put this whole scenario on asteroids. Well, those companies will be gone, Sarah. All those companies are gonna be gone. The, cha the, 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 the challenge that the employees having today of not only having, being afraid, and being away from work, of working, and being highly productive, but at the same time taking care of their children, 
they can care of the house. The, the, the burden that they have is humongous. So that's why I say that it's us as business leaders that we need to change and make that pain and that stress lessen. And that's why you see companies thinking about how to increase and how to enhance these employees. So it's a paradox because it's two things pulling at, at different, at a different uh, ways, but at a different direction, which is going to break. It's going to, unless we as leaders try not to, to get that elastic broken. Yeah, very, very interesting time we're in. So as a leader, again, the responsibility is on the leader. Most companies are saying, what my employees are going to do for me? Why my employees are not reacting? Why my employees not bringing me the solution? It's not the employee time. It's the, employee, it's the, it's the time of the leader. Right. It's a, that, that could be a saying. This is the time for the leader. Absolutely. The, it is the time for the leader. It's not the time for the employee. Absolutely. Okay, there's one more question. I know it's one minute past. So, so Tatiana asks, can we get an example of how to use the model in a specific business situation? Are there different aspects of the model, a process, or just areas to work on? Very simple. Sit down and analyze your core competencies. Look at your business and see what are my core competencies. What are my attributes and what are my weakness? That put that in one column. In the second column, put what is it that you're trying to achieve. In the third column, try to match each of the, each of the um, attributes of the infinity model and try to match it to each of, each of those that you have there. What you're going to see, if you sort them out, you're going to be able to, to understand what are the key competencies that you need to change, focus, and be resilient to endure for the next one or two years. That will help you transform your organization in a simple way that that's what it, and you can do that for your life, by the way. I mean, you don't need to have a business. You can do, you can use exactly the same model. And, and by the way, you said that you, I mean, it's funny, it's true. When you moved into Boca Raton, you were the first one that introduced me. And uh, that was a long time ago. Yes, I've been working, providing video conferencing for more than 25 years. Now everyone has Zoom. Everyone has WebEx. Everyone has Team. That didn't exist 25 years ago. So what happened to us is that, oh, something that we had, now everyone has. We needed to transform. We needed to innovate. We needed to transform. And that has to be a never-ending cycle. Right. Well, and, and that the... the the last thing you just gave us specifics on how we can do this exercise. So Tatiana says, thank you. That's very clear. And I agree. I think it was, you gave us very specific instructions and it's true. I mean, you, you again have been ahead of the game for many, many years. Um, and so, you know, everything you say now, we should take, take serious, uh, uh, notes on because you know in 20 years we're going to say Luis told us so 20 years ago so well, Sarah if we don't need this this time around it will not take 20 the changes are happening so fast that we need to reinvent ourselves literally every three to six months well, we look forward to having you come on every three to six months. And thank you very much for taking the time today and presenting and, and giving us all the, the, the much needed boost uh, in our business and for personally. So we appreciate it. Um, I want to just remind everyone tomorrow, it has, if anyone's received, which I'm sure you have, a lot of you have received the PPP loan. Um, we do have our chairman, uh, Michael Daskell, will be presenting along with his colleagues on how to start the process of the forgiveness piece. So, you know, if, you're, if anybody on this call is interested, make sure you register for that. It's free, of course, um, but it'll be, you know, a step-by-step, -step, very uh, educational process on how to get through that because that's not going to be 
an easy thing to understand. So we have the experts, kind of like we had Lisa as our expert today on, on strategy and the future of our business and ourselves. So, um, and then I also want to remind you that our breakfast next week, next Thursday, is our Golden Bell Education Foundation breakfast. So that's where we will be giving $105,000 to local public schools, K through 12. I know, Kirsten, I know you're probably going to be on that, representing a lot of the nonprofits. Um, but uh, make sure to attend that. And, and you know, just it, in this day when we cannot see each other personally, the 300 of us at a breakfast together, it's still very touching to see these schools, these teachers, these students, and, and hear from some of the students. Um, you know, and, and just celebrate our, our community. So I hope you can, can attend that as well. And uh, Luis, any last words before we can, you know, close the meeting? No, no, thank you for the opportunity. As always, I'm here and, and, and we can do this again. And, uh, uh, and anyone that has additional questions, they can send it to you and I will yeah. kindly reply. Absolutely. Send us some questions or um, this will be recorded. So that's good. We can go back on those slides too. So there are some interesting stats on there. So thank you all again. And I hope to see you tomorrow at the PPP workshop event, if not next Thursday at the breakfast. Thank you and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.